Hi, this is Paul Check. Welcome back to part two of What the Health and my commentary on What the Health. I hope you enjoyed part one. Forgive me if I get a little fired up in part two, but there's some things I'm telling you we got to pay attention to. So let's get started. Next, we have the issue of factory farming. Now, they were going after the factory farming and using that as an excuse to say why we shouldn't be eating meat and downplaying meat. And I totally agree. We should not be supporting factory farming, whether it be farming of chickens, pigs, lamb, beef, or even fish. And then you've got all the dairy products that are coming from these factory farms where they milk the cows and inject them with hormones and all sorts of stuff and milk them when they're pussing and the list just goes on. There's a great book called Milk the Deadly Poison. I can't remember the author's name, but he's an MD. I'm sure you can find it. When you start looking into the whole dairy industry as the show What the Health explains, it's a dangerous situation we've got. When you look at the devastation to the lands, North Carolina, as the movie shows, and my research shows is poisoned by factory farms. But a lot of this stuff is based on a, a false motive. And the whole concept of bio, a lot of the biotechnology in factory farming is that we have too many people to feed and we can't feed them organically. Ladies and gentlemen, that is absolute horseshit. Horseshit, to put it politely. Here's a book called Farmers of 40 Centuries. It's an old book, early 1900s. I don't have my glasses on to tell you the published date on this thing. But it's, the key point is the United States government a long time ago became very curious about how a country like China, who's only got 14% of its land mass as arable land, which means farmable, could feed so many people on such a small land mass and how other countries like Japan and Korea were doing it as well. So they had a man named F.H. King, a doctor of science, an expert in agriculture, do an investigation into how they were doing it, and that's what this book is. And it shows you that a Japanese farmer farming organic, or a Korean, or a Chinese farmer, could produce more food on one and two-thirds of an acre farming organically than the average American farmer could produce on 40 acres of land farming commercially, and that was a long time ago before there was massive use of pesticides and related chemicals and probably very little use of chemical fertilizers, but they were just simply using very well-thought-out principles of organic farming, and this is a great book to see that. Then we've got Fatal Harvest, the tragedy of industrial agriculture. So this whole vegetarian and veganism drive, which, which seems to be getting stronger and stronger, it, it may be a sign of people's loss of religious uh, trust or desperation or needing a group to hold on to with an identity. But this movie, What the Health, sure talks a lot about being a vegetarian and has veganism slants to it. And they talk a lot about the danger of animals, but what they do not talk about, and most vegetarians do not talk about, is the absolute destruction of commercial agriculture to animals and animal habitats, to the destruction of birds, to the destruction of earthworms, which are one of the key cultivators of the soil, and the, how those chemicals completely wipe out the microorganism population. And therefore, we are talking about modern agriculture, the stuff that makes you the food you buy in the store is very dangerous and kills unbelievable amounts of animals, and the chemicals get into rivers, lakes, streams, and the ocean and are causing huge problems with the hormonal systems. We've got all sorts of problems with fish and frogs and all sorts of creatures having their hormonal systems completely screwed up, sexual problems, hermaphroditic animals. We've got high levels of toxicity in sea mammals, 
whales and dolphins dying on beaches all over the world. We've got problems being linked now to the bees that have been tracked right back to various pesticide use. And Rudolf Steiner warned a long time ago that when we reach a critical level of the population of trees or bees, we will cease to know life on this planet as we've known it. The bees are basically the sex organs of the planet and the trees are essentially the lungs and they're the home to a myriad of living creatures and have very important effects on the soil and atmospheric control, water control, temperature control, a lot of things. So I think it's very important that all of you vegetarians out there start standing up to the fact that if you're supporting commercial agriculture and you're not supporting organic farming, then you are supporting the destruction of animals and animal habitats at all levels from microorganisms all the way to the deer. I live right next to, I'm working right next to a commercial farm and they hired a professional hunter to come out there and kill all the deer because they were eating the persimmons off their trees. Now, you can be a happy little vegetarian eating persimmons right off of farms like that, but don't realize that just to get you that damn persimmon, a whole pile of deer got shot, and I get to sit here and listen to them get fired at every day, and those deer are my friends. Natives all over the world worship the animals and worship the earth, and the secret is to give everything a chance to live and to live in a natural environment and to share love and respect with all things as expressions of the earth or of the divine, whatever orientation you want to take, but realize that only human beings have the ability to make intelligent choices, and you can't do that when you're sick or out of balance. So torturing a human being, i.e. yourself, to try to eat as a vegan or a vegetarian when it is not natural for you and is causing health problems is torturing the one animal that can make a change and can control the flow of money by using their money only to support companies that are sus uh, practicing sustainable practices for the benefit of all life. I have nothing against vegetarianism before you start writing me a bunch of nasty letters, which happens all the time. I have been a vegetarian, as I've shared multiple times, twice in my life. It's not about me having anything against any form of diet ratio. It's all about what is sustainable and what does it take for you to be a healthy, vital person who can love yourself enough to be honest with yourself and share that love with the world. And that's where we're really running into trouble. And frankly, all these isms are really symptoms of a world population in a deep state of confusion and chaos. And many of these vegetarian people are doing it because they're following some guru, but they forget a lot of these gurus have evolved themselves through potentially many, many lifetimes to the point where their vibration's high enough that they don't need to eat a lot of flesh foods. And I've literally experienced that and seen that in my own lifetime. But what you need to do for you is a spiritual practice to the degree that it keeps you healthy and keeps you conscious and keeps you grounded as a participant in the world. But as a guy who's coached countless vegetarians through diseases and health problems that sat there and told me the same arguments you hear all the time in vegetarian books and on television, how healthy it was, I have to ask them, well, why are you here paying, paying me a lot of money? Because you're sick if what you're saying is true. And it often takes that moment of realization to wake up to the fact, well, maybe it's true that I'm really not doing that well on a vegetarian diet. And just to balance it out, I think eating too much meat is just as bad. Our culture is way over the top with meat consumption. I would say the average person that I see out there is probably eating somewhere between two and three or even five times more animal flesh a week than they actually need for a healthy body. And that's disrespectful to the earth, it's disrespectful to the animals, it's disrespectful to life itself. So one of the things that I wanted to point out here, they didn't mention the organic issue, they didn't mention the problem with agriculture, they seem very happy to promote commercial food and commercial produce and fruit, which as I showed you is coming right from a process that damages 
animal habitats and animals and the soil itself. And interestingly enough, I found research all the way back in 1961 showing that the average American farming family completely destroys beyond repair 7,000 acres of farmland in the life of that family. And we were running out of good farmland and topsoil was already a major issue in the early 1960s, yet we keep playing all these biotech games and commercial farming games and believing what people say on television, which is a bloody death sentence if you don't pay attention. And some of these people are so rich that they're stupid. You know, I, I often make the kind of correlation between a drug pusher. Drug pushers go out and give drugs away to get people addicted. But if they give too many drugs away and kill off their clientele, then they're not a very smart drug dealer. Well, we've got a lot of really dumb drug dealers selling sugar and all sorts of poison that they call food, and they are literally killing off their customers. So you have to kind of wonder what's really the driving motive here, because you can't eat money, you, you can't drink money, you can't breathe money. And what we've got in this Western capitalist model is a bunch of people that are so oriented toward the bottom line, i.e. money, that they're willing to even let their children eat poison and run around to hospitals. And this is not a big sign of intelligence. You know, you have to worry about a culture that can't even pay attention to things that are obvious while it builds nuclear weapons and spends huge amounts of money on war efforts and believes everything that it reads because some scientist wrote it or some doctor wrote it or it's in some research journal and then does it and gets fatter and sicker and keeps doing it. That We should all be concerned about that. Now, <clears throat> Weston Price, Sir Robert McCarrison, Francis Marion Pottinger, many, many others. Uh, a good example would be, uh, here's a great book called Sir Albert Howard. He's considered to be one of the most highly respected agriculturalists that ever lived. This guy made various types of compost ranging, ranging from vegetarian compost to compost with table scraps with meat, bones, and flesh in it. Then he cre grew crops of identical species and he purposely harvested barrels of parasites known to attack these crops. And he then released the parasites into the crops with vegetarian compost. One grade, if I remember right, had hair added to it. Another one had drops of blood added to it. And the other one had table scrap, scraps. And he showed that crop losses due to parasites were only about 3 to 4% in the compost that was made with table scraps including including meat and bones and the highest crop losses were in the crops raised on vegetarian compost this is also quite an old document so this information's been out for a long time then we've got another phenomenal book the living soil and the holly experiment by eb balfour lady eve balfour was probably one of the very key founders of the whole concept that we have today of organic farming. And then you've got Rudolf Steiner's biodynamic farming, which research shows produces even better quality nutrition and is even better for long-term maintenance of the soil and actually grows the soil to be progressively healthier from generation to generation of biodynamic farming. This book not only is a phenomenal book, but right in this book, written in the 40s, she shows you that the mycorrhiza, the fungi in the soil that work with the plants to feed them, liquefy minerals and feed them in trade for sap, sap from the plants and trees, eat parasites, which are animals, and feed them to the plants. This book shows you, my friends, vegetarian friends, plants are carnivorous. 85% of all plants are mycorrhiza formers, and therefore you've got to decide what, when does your game of eating an animal stop? I say if you shrunk your dog down to the size of a, a bug and you stepped on it, would you still feel sad that you'd killed your dog? Most people say yes. Well, we've got to remember animals go all the way down into the insect kingdom and they are basically the ones that keep the soil alive and keep the earth functioning. 
So if we just pretend that we're not eating animals when we're not looking at the real science that's right in front of us that's been around for a long time, it's a very, very dangerous game to play. So I talked about habit dest destruction, bird traffic on commercially farmed fields. Research shows go down about 85%. Many of the birds are poisoned and die, and, and a lot of them won't come back. We kill the microorganisms, which are essential for soil nutrition, for temperature regulation, for conserving water. Um, and then we have to be concerned about what we all need. We all have to have earth. We live on the earth, and if the earth isn't healthy and it's toxic and we can't grow food and we have to turn to biotechnology, we're playing a very, very dangerous, dangerous game. I won't even get into the GMO thing. That's another silly adventure. We have to have clean water, but we're running out of it very fast, largely due to all these corporations poisoning everything so you can have cheap toys to play with and cheap clothes and cheap watches and cheap garbage, none of which enhances your life really any. Another microwave, big deal. So what? Another microwave and you're, now you're ruining your food and you're ruining your health all because you saved, what, eight minutes? Okay, we have to have healthy air. We're poisoning the air. Don't forget, when you poison the air in China with your factory, then that air gets into the jet stream and it becomes our air. And when we poison our air in the United States, it becomes China's air and everybody else's air. So we have to wake up to the fact that we are not living in compartments that isolate from each other. We have to stop all the warring and all the fighting and realize that this is one world and we are one species, humans, living on this thing and we have to be wise enough to protect it and share it together because unfortunately people that seem to have a lot of money and a lot of power have an inverse relationship to intelligence when it comes right down to what equals sustainability, right? In other words, they're bad drug dealers. And we all have to be concerned about fire, the, the four basic elements, earth, water, fire, and air. Fire is our metabolism, and we have bodies that are inflamed all over the place. That's one of the things you see with all this obesity is bodies that are hot and swollen. There's so many people eating so many genetically modified foods, additives, preservatives, colorings, emulsifiers, and flavorings, many of which are gastrointestinal inflammatory, that they're constantly craving cold liquids. So what do they do? They drink soda pop with ice cubes in it instead of drinking water and instead of just balancing their diet out so they're not on fire all the time. So when it comes to fire, we have the issue of internal fire. We've got the issue that the more land you destroy with commercial farming for any reason, the more you destroy the Earth's ability to regulate its temperature and overheat the Earth, and the more of a greenhouse effect you bring on. So we can do some pretty interesting things by uncovering the Earth's protective surface. We've almost run out of topsoil. It takes a hell of a long time to make an inch of topsoil, and people aren't paying attention to that. So. We need to be conscious when we're watching documentaries like this not to just get swept into another one-sided story that leads to a lot of problems. And then we have to remember that we have a lot of problems with obesity and eating disorders of all types today. And one of the things that I want to share in closing is that one of the problems that we have is that today... It's very stressful because we're dealing with way too much communications, way too much financial stress. The corporate powers have put us in this kind of nice little box and got you running on a treadmill, always trying to chase after the next car, the next house, the next gimmick, the next style of clothing. And they just got you right where they want you. Noam Chomsky warned about this very, very well, as have many others. If you look at the book, The Human Zoo by Desmond Morse, he shows you what happens to animals when they're taken out of the wild and put into zoos, and he shows you that the same stuff happens to people in cities for the same reasons. My point is this. We must remember that the physical body feeds on food. 
the emotional body feeds on emotions and the mental body feeds on thought. If you keep feeding yourself negative emotions because you're not paying attention to the way you're living, then the emptiness you have can only be filled by love and positive emotions, not food. But people mistake that sense of emptiness as a physical emptiness and they eat and eat and eat to try to deal with their emotions unconscious of what they're doing. And if you have a head full of negative thoughts or what I call stinking thinking, then you also tend to feel more isolated, more alone and more afraid and tend to people tend to use food, especially high sugar foods and feel good foods to try to create a sense of connection. But really the sense of connection needs to come from using your mind effectively, which is what I call Dr. Happiness and having a dream in life. And when you have a dream, then you're willing to work through the work of becoming well mentally self-managed and learning to manage your emotions and learning to work with other people to create something meaningful, meaningful and beautiful and sustainable. We all need to think about sustainability at this point. So my closing comment is for everyone to be very conscious of using food to try to fill an emptiness that comes from an emotional imbalance or a mental imbalance. And those two typically go hand in hand because thoughts and emotions, shall we say, are like two sides of a coin. I would like to close by saying there are very intelligent people out there that have looked into this stuff and we can feed everyone on this planet. It makes me very sad that we have enough money and enough food and enough resources to feed, house, and give everybody clean water, but we're too busy driving BMWs and trying to build space, space stations on frickin' Mars and the moon and silly ass shit like that and spending truckloads of money on a defense budget in the United States when that's just one of the most dangerous big industries there is. So in closing, what the health has some decent stuff in it, but it's also full of very manipulative concepts, manipulation and partial truths and doesn't show you the real truth. And the reality of it is, as Weston A. Price showed in his book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, he could not find a healthy vegetarian tribe anywhere in the world. Anytime he found healthy vegetarians, there was a meat eating tribe close by that had better health and he documented that. He was not against vegetarianism. He was just curious to see if, if he could find one. The number one limiting factor for how much meat people ate in any culture he studied around the world was simply availability. You can look at that, just look right at the Aboriginal culture. Inland Aboriginals eat about 75% plant food and only about 25% animal food, which includes things like widgety grubs and insects because there's just not much big game in the desert out there. But the coastal aboriginals eat about 75% flesh food and only about 25% plant food, relatively speaking, because of availability. And they're the same root race of people just living in different areas. Byron Robinson, MD, dissected a lot of bodies and was looking to see if there was a difference in the length of the digestive tracts of people from different regions of the world on different diets. And he showed in his research that people could have a entron, which is mouth to anus measurement of as high as 41 or 42 feet or as short as 21 feet. And lo and behold, he found those that ate more meat, such as the Inuit, or the Eskimos had shorter digestive tracts, but those that lived in regions where meat was not readily available progressively grew longer digestive tracts. And when you see comments by vegetarians saying cows make a lot of muscle by eating plants, they don't tell you that a cow's got five stomachs to ferment protein out of fiber. We don't have five stomachs. So as Byron Robinson's research showed, we do adapt over time, but that takes a long time. The simple solution is pay attention to your body. In my book, The Last Four Doctors You'll Ever Need, How to Get Healthy Now, I show you how to manage your mind and keep your emotions moving in the direction of your dream and use exercise and rest as part of a living philosophy with 
Dr. Happiness for clear thinking and knowing what happiness is for you. Dr. Quiet, so you know how to use rest. Dr. Movement, so you know how to exercise properly. And Dr. Diet, so you know how to eat properly. No living philosophy can be a philosophy that produces sustainable health without awareness of those four factors. My book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, as I've said many times on my blogs, has a series of questionnaires that shows you right where you're out of balance and has chapters that you can use to counterbalance yourself by knowing what to do. It's got lots of pictures. It's got mind maps so that those of you that don't like reading very much can look at the pictures and read the mind maps. It's helped countless thousands of people balance themselves out. Many vegetarians found this book and realized, wow, I'm really out of balance followed it and got themselves healthy. Countless numbers of people have gotten their kids and family off medical drugs just using the book. Then if you want to go deeper or you want to start off with a more comprehensive approach, you can go right to chekinstitute.com and check out our Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 1 program, which is for the public, that teaches you how to use these principles and more, teaches you how to do zone exercises for cultivating energy, and gives you what you need to get healthy. And as I said, I don't have any dogma. I just teach people the tools so they can decide through a variety of methods what is it that their body needs so they can get healthy. So I'd like to say thank you to the people that produced What the Health, but I also have to say, in all fairness, you use the same kind of tactics to convince people to eat a vegetarian diet that are really the same kind of trickery and tactics and manipulation of research that is used by the very people that you're criticizing in the movie. And so, though I'm grateful you expose some of these corporate entities, I would encourage you, the producers of What the Health, to become a little more honest and a little more balanced in your approach, or you're actually funding the destruction of more animal habitats and doing the exact things that most vegetarians don't realize they're doing by promoting the consumption of food by commercial farming without being honest about organic farming and its capacity to support the planet and feed us and help us all be sane together. So thanks for joining me. Sorry if I got a little excited, but I still get surprised at how much silliness there is out there after 32 years in this line of work and countless lectures around the world and seeing countless documentaries. And there's a lot of very wise people out there, but it seems like the wise people don't get the press and don't get listened to. But silly people with lots of money to make and lots of isms do seem to get a lot of press. And maybe that's just a sign of the state of dysfunction we're in. But those of you that can see the logic and the rationale and are will, willing to do the research, I'm sure will find that what I'm sharing with you is very grounded in reality and straight up. And I grew up on a farm, so I'm not just talking about something that I don't know about. So thanks for joining me. Look forward to sharing something with you soon. I'm Paul Check.